Okay. So we were. So, sind alle da auf oder? Wir sind die Ehrende. Und dann müsste er funktionieren, genau. Super. Und einschalten noch den Logitech. Darf ich mal ganz kurz? Mhm. Die nehmen alles auf, ne? Mhm. Gut. Haben wir einen Flyer kurz ausgedruckt von unserem so. Programm, von unserem Flyer? Haben wir das? Jetzt ist er an. Should I come later or with the second panel? Or should I... No, you should sit here. You should sit here. Sit here. Yes, um, can you hear me? Everybody's doing their own label. Hello? Um, <coughs> okay, I take this one. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, may I ask everyone to take the seats so we can start? Um, I'm very happy to, um, to welcome you here on, on today's side event on the blockchain technology and climate action, uh, the side event by the Climate Ledger Initiative, um, jointly hosted by the government of Liechtenstein and INFRAS. Um, I will introduce my, my colleagues that will give presentations when their turn is on. Um, I would like now to give the floor first to our, our hosts, uh, the representatives of um, of Liechtenstein and our colleague from Switzerland um, before we go into the detailed and more focused discussions. So Panayotos uh, Podolius Beck from Liechtenstein, you have the floor. Welcome. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the government of the Principality of Liechtenstein, I have the honor to deliver some brief welcome remarks to you. Let me first introduce myself. My name is Panayotis Potolidis Beck, and I am the head of the Unit of, for Environment and Sustainable Development with the Office for Foreign Affairs. In this function, I'm in charge of climate issues uh, at the office and also of the co or coordination of the SDGs implementation in Liechtenstein. Back in 2015, I had the great honor to be part of the Liechtenstein delegation for COP21 and actively negotiating the Paris Agreement. As most of you will still remember, the negotiations were tough and difficult. However, during the whole COP in Paris, everyone could feel the spirit of transformation. The positive contribution of all actors finally led to the adoption of, of the historic agreement. Never before I had experienced such a euphoric moment as right after the, uh, the adoption of the agreement. Everyone in the room was aware of the historic value of that moment. Almost two years after Paris, the Paris Agreement has already entered into force and has been ratified by 169 states. Proudly I can say that my country has also ratified the Paris Agreement in September this year. At the same time, this means that the implementation of our NDC becomes part of our international obligations. Liechtenstein will undertake all necessary efforts to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 40% until 2030 compared to the 1990 level. We are also committed to support developing countries in this process by providing climate finance. Since 2012, Liechtenstein has provided more than 2 million Swiss francs of new and additional means for climate finance. And we are committed to continue to mobilize means for climate finance projects. Two years after Paris, the task we have to fulfill is even more difficult than to negotiate an agreement. Now it is time to implement our commitments. For many years, Liechtenstein has been a strong advocate for an agreement that is ambitious equally binding for all states, and that has a strong transparency framework, taking into account national circumstances. Now that the NDCs of the parties are known, 
We have to find innovative ways to support their full implementation and to ensure that all actions that are undertaken are clear and transparent for all. As many of you may know, Liechtenstein is a small state with hardly more than 37,000 inhabitants. Nonetheless, the country is one of the most industrialized countries in the world and has an innovative financial center. Innovation is the primary driver of Liechtenstein's success. Innovation is also needed in the implementation of the Paris commitments. And this is where Liechtenstein and the Climate Ledger Initiative come together. Back in 2016, the, the, the Life Climate Foundation Liechtenstein, which is a think tank for bridging together environmental and financial actors based on a private-public partnership, was one of the first supporters of the Climate Ledger Initiative. The CLI aims to provide substa substantial research on the possible contribution of digital technologies like blockchain to the, the implementation of the Paris Agreement. Innovation and digitalization are crucial for achieving sustainable development. The Liechtenstein government has put significant emphasis on these topics in its government program for the years 2017 to 2021. Therefore, it is a great pleasure for us to have the opportunity of co-hosting this event together with INFRAS. In this context, I have also the pleasure to announce that the Liechtenstein government has decided to provide 50,000 Swiss francs for the CLI. We believe that this initiative has a great potential to identify ways how digital technologies can support the transparent implementation of NDCs and to ensure transparency in the use of market mechanisms and the provision of climate finance. With that said, I would like to thank all the experts who have taken up and developed the CLI and also for the hard work they have done to organize this event. I would also like to thank Switzerland for their kind support they have provided to the CLI so far. Also, I would like to thank Climate, Climate Kick, which kindly supports uh, use cases. And we're looking forward to a close and fruitful cooperation within CLI. I'm now looking forward to listen carefully to the contribution of all panelists and to the discussion that will follow the presentations. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Panayotis. Thank you. Uh, may I now ask uh, Mr. Philipp Escher from the Swiss government uh, to give his welcome note as one of our other donors of the initiative. Um, so, Philipp, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Sven, for giving me the floor. Just a few remarks. I mean, in the first place, I'm happy to welcome all of you here at the uh, at side event. And I'm looking forward to uh, very interesting uh, presentations now and uh, interesting discussions. I also would like to thank uh, Liechtenstein very much for their support for this initiative. And we are very happy to have them on board and to, to go together and see where actually these new technologies can lead us. How does it come that Switzerland is part of this initiative? Uh, the Swiss Agency of Development and Cooperation, the SCC, had some innovation money available for 2017. You can see also administration are interested in innovation and they are curious. That's actually the main driver why SCC decided to become part of this initiative because they are curious. They are curious on the potential of blockchain. They're curious how blockchain in the future could be used to um, tackle some of the main pressing uh, climate issues. And this not only in the domain of mitigation, but especially also in the domain of adaptation. So therefore, one of the reasons why actually SEC invi uh, invested in the initiative is here because they see a big potential that this innovative technology could contribute to the much needed effective implementation of the Paris Agreement. In my personal view, blockchain has definitely this potential in the context of climate change, and this for adaptation as well as mitigation. But its diffusion, deployment, and use will not happen automatically, and definitely not only because the technology is as such promising, at least at the moment, sexy. 
I don't want to conceal um, that some skepticism remains on our side, especially for the domain mitigation. Why is this so? The challenges we face currently in the context of mitigation, especially regarding the operationalization of Article 6, are mainly of political and institutional nature. In the NDC world and in a world um, where corresponding adjustment has to be mandatory, many political, social, and economic questions have to be answered before a potential host or buying country will be ready to unlock the undoubtful potential of market mechanisms. It is clear that the CO2 market, carbon market, will be regulated or it will just not arise. Direct consequence, blockchain as technology can only then play a role when the institutional setting, the legal and social environment allows it. Therefore, the outcome of the ongoing negotiation will, at least in short run, have a big influence on the applicability of blockchain in the context of mitigation. But now I wish all of us a very interesting side event, and I'm looking very much forward to, uh, to the discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Um, now I have the pleasure to um, introduce myself. I'm Sven Braden. Um, was a long uh, member of the Liechtenstein delegation, um, and now decided to give my uh, perspective or give my focus full on the on the blockchain technology because it's a really amazing thing. I will now skip. Uh, for, for like eight minutes into the technology pattern uh, which is called the hash algorithm um, because I think this is a fundamental and once you this 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 technology or this this uh, formula is understood um, the the blockchain gets a little a little bit more uh, demystified so um, blockchain and climate the fundamentals um, you've heard about blockchains being super safe and uh, it's it's distributed it's uh, democratic so why is that so and where is my presentation um, ah, it's there so um, what we it's this one yeah yeah okay um, what we have today is um, a centralized system. We, we have it uh, noted here, like notary, notary cleaning ho clearing house. Um, that's especially when we talk in the context of the UNFCCC. All the greenhouse gas inventories, they go to the secretariat to bond for review, for checks. Um, the same is with the uh, ITL, the registry that, that manages the CER, um, the CDM credit um, um, transfers, and so on. This technology comes with a new approach, uh, a decentralized approach. The data is not stored centralized, but it is distributed over many participating computers. And uh, generally, all transactions in the network are transparent for its participants. And uh, the whole thing is, is guaranteed via the application of a protocol or of, of clients that run on, on these network computers. But the actual beautiful and magic thing is the, the hash algorithm. So what is a hash? Um, you can think of a hash as uh, something like the digital uh, fingerprint of, of data. So every data has the same hash. Um, a hash algorithm is nothing but uh, some sort of a cross-sum mixer that takes data, um, transfers it into numbers, and then puts it into a, a formula of multiplications, factors, and at the end you have the same hash for the same data. It never changes. So for my name, the hash is always this 32-digit um, long, um, I don't know, formula. Um, the same is true for a sentence, like nothing is decided until everything is decided. This sentence has always this hash. And you, can, you, you have also to note that you cannot uh, conclude back from the hash to the original sentence. That's not possible. But actually, that's a feature. I will uh, jump into this a bit later. So we have the sentence here. Nothing is decided until everything is decided. If you only change a, a little dot in this sentence, the whole hash will look differently, like here. That's the hash of, of everything's decided. And the interesting thing is you can hash everything. You can hash 50,000 pages of, uh, of an encyclopedia, and it will always have a hash with 32 digits. 
And uh, if you change only one comma in these 50,000 pages, it will have a different hash. And, uh, and that's, that's actually the, 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 the powerful um, tool of the blockchain and every blockchain network uh, relies on, on this uh, um, formula technology. So we take now one of the instruments of the Paris Agreement, um, Article 6.2, um, that is the, the tra tra transaction of ITMOS, International Transferable Mitigation Outcomes. You see on the left side, this is the data set. It's nothing but my name or, or even the sentence, nothing is decided until everything is decided. So this is just sentences, data. So what we do now is we hash that data. We call this block, block one hash. The hash of this uh, information, um, USA to Japan, 18 ITMOS, to Valu, Monaco, 12 ITMOS, and so on, has always that hash. The next block that is generated comes again with, uh, with information like Vietnam to Australia, US to Japan, and so on. But before we hash that, we put the previous hash into this block. So, and this data will then be hashed, and so on. So you have a relation always, uh, the, the current block has always a relation with the, with the one before. And if I would now change one of these ITMOS in the first transaction, Switzerland to Mexico from 31 to 31 million, that would change the hash and the chain would be broken. And that is how the blockchain achieves immutability. But the other interesting thing is that um, it also guarantees an effective decentralization because the databases of today, they face the challenge to put um, their database system into sync. Um, they have to use a lot of, um, of, of back, uh, back office technology and, and electricity to, en to ensure that all the ledgers have the same have the same information. With a blockchain approach, you just have to take the last hash and compare it with the computers of your partnering network participants. And that makes it so powerful. You don't have to check all the data sets of all the other computers. You only have to, uh, to, um, to check the hash. And once this syncs, uh, that makes it um, so wonderful and, and uh, from a potential point of view, uh, completely on a new level. So the blockchain hashes, they ensure immutability. At the end, they ensure trust because once you have the hash, you can always check if, if we're talking about the same originate, original data set. Uh, as I said, it ensures effective decentralization by providing means to sync distributed data sets. And uh, of course, uh, because it's decentralized, it's not a one single point uh, of a failure. Uh, it increases data security on a new level. So I hope uh, I have not put too much of tech uh, in this uh, couple of minutes. Um, but um, I'm sure that, uh, that this was important. Thank you. And Nick, can you do? And I introduce you. So I'm uh, happy to announce the next speaker, which is Nick Beglinger. He's the CEO of Cleantech 21. And originally, he was the initiator of the project. And um, he will give us a, a quick overview uh, about the history and about uh, the activity outlook of, of the Climate Ledger Initiative. Yep. Nick, you have the floor. Thanks very much, Sven. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I titled my uh, uh, few minutes action at the blockchain climate intersection for those who are in the climate scene. That me, you probably link the words action, climate action. Uh, our point here is that for this climate action, um, blockchain, uh, distributed ledger technologies in general should be re looked at uh, seriously. Um, that there is lots of potential in this area and that there are very good reasons to look at it now. If we take a step back from Sven's technology um, highlight, I think it's fair to say that there's some very fundamental things happening um, in terms of the way the world develops. And one of them that we can clearly state is that very, very many things 
across different industries, across different sectors, activities in the social and the economic field, um, many of those activities show this trend from central to decentral. And looking at it a little bit more close, um, one starts to understand that going decentral has a huge number of advantages in very many sectors for very many different players. Uh, in general, uh, decentral means distributed. And when you're distributed, for example, in energy, you find out that you're more resilient. You can grow faster in the sense of spread uh, electricity more rapidly uh, to those who don't have it yet. And even though um, maybe at the outset uh, you would still think a central energy system where one big plant over a big network supplies to all the people, uh, that's actually the less secure, less resilient type system than a distributed system where everybody is actually producing their own energy. Um, they don't primarily send it somewhere, but they use it themselves first, and if they share, they share close by. That's a distributed system with advantages. It has advantages in security, in inclusiveness, um, in smartness, and in cleanliness. We don't have time to go into lots of details here, but uh, quote me on these attributes later on uh, in the questions. Industry has bought into this. This is a few days ago on Swiss TV. A uh, gentleman on the left is the CEO of UBS. The gentleman on the right is the CEO of Credit Suisse. They're the two largest Swiss banks. That was a program on the blockchain, and the message that that program had, because they had a, a one a few days before on Bitcoin, which is a particular use of the blockchain technology and should not be set equal to the blockchain or distributed ledger technologies in general. These two gentlemen have, have used, has been used as a case in point to state that we are using blockchain now to save costs. That's their motivation. Now, they're banks, and they're also threatened by things going from central to, to decentral because they're the big guys and very much in the central world, but they're already using it because of costs. Um, last year in Marrakesh, the fact that there is lots of interesting potential in this distributed uh, world already emerging was clear already then. And I kind of cruised those lovely tents uh, we had there, um, really because I saw a dissync between what industry is doing, what people like the World Economic Forum were writing clearly about, and what was uh, sort of the general view amongst negotiators. Many of those have not recognized blockchain a year ago. And the few who had, they would usually associate it immediately with Bitcoin, and they would usually associate it negatively. They would tell me about, you know, the dark net, silk road, dangerous kind of thing. They were telling me about lots of energy cons consumption. And these are all real problems. But focusing only on these and being too skeptical would miss a huge opportunity because there are problems there, but there's also huge opportunities to use that technology for the purpose we're all here, for climate action, not to reduce cost only, but just for fostering climate action. Uh, we look at this as a really uh, sort of revolutionary step coming. So the basic logic of the climate ledger initiative that uh, my foundation has initiated a year ago in this Marrakesh uh, sort of couloirs, and uh, to which Liechtenstein as a government has said yes first. And I must at this point thank uh, Liechtenstein most sincerely because that's really when leadership counts, when everybody else thinks you're a little cuckoo. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's one government that sticks to you and tells you, hey, that sounds kind of interesting. Let's give it a try. Let's talk about this. So that's what we did. And, and the fundamental logic here is very simple. We have climate as the world's key challenge. It's the biggest problem we all need to solve. And we have blockchain as one of the key innovation drivers. So it's kind of logical to just bring these two together and look very carefully at the intersection that they, that they provide. And that's really what we're doing. We've had lessons learned, and I uh, Sven touched on some of those issues that, that these type of technologies bring to us. We, you, know, it, you can allow, do things decentral, you increase transparency, you make things more secure. So I mentioned it's irrefutable uh, processes you can create. There are many, many, many advantages that um, are broad, 
not only confined to markets or confined to Article 6, but they're broad and they can apply to many sides. Hence, the Climate Ledger Initiative was born. Um, I was privileged to have huge, hugely experienced and also sometimes very, um, uh, uh, how do I say, understanding uh, partners in this with, with Sven, um, with whom it all started kind of thing, uh, Jörg Füßler of Infos, and then very importantly as well, and unfortunately not here today, Marion Verles of uh, the Gold Standard Foundation. We have formed this team and formulated the Climate Ledger Initiative to say this intersection needs attention and that's what the Climate Ledger Initiative is all about. We do this in three pillars and uh, you'll be uh, hearing from um, sort of those pillars in, in a sec. Uh, the most important one is the research pillar that is, is going to be presented to you tonight by uh, uh, Jörg Füßler, uh, where it's really about understanding where should research be, be be applied to try to understand that. And then there is an innovation pillar that basically is about understanding. So if we know these areas are interesting, how can we make them real, these opportunities, and how we can get innovation use cases running? And then there's a third pillar, and that third pillar is the shout out awareness type pillar that uh, is sort of part of this uh, package of the Climate Ledger Initiative. So before I shut up, um, there is a, my sort of favorite current project uh, in this Climate Ledger Initiative that I have taken charge of the last three months, and that's the Hack for Climate. For the first time, uh, linked to a climate conference, we're going to do a hackathon this year here at COP. We have done 17 workshops uh, in September in 17 global blockchain centers. We've reached 1,300 developers. And these 1,300 developers were firstly sort of exposed to the issue of climate change. And we try to tell them that if they have this blockchain know-how, there is indeed interesting areas in climate that we can address with them. We had an application process, selected the best um, out of 30 countries. And next week, they're going to be all here in Bonn. We're located on a boat that symbolizes a small island state and therefore the need for climate action. Um, so it's like the pirate blockchain kind of action boat. And uh, the aim is to show here in Bonn that there is really large potential in this intersection. So to conclude, I think we can really say, and maybe you can afterwards mention your own experience in this, the world is going from central to decentral. And in this process, uh, we think it's hugely important that regulators who shape the framework for which innovation is afterwards there to hit the market if you want, that these regulators understand that things are going distributed. Because if they are, then a whole different set of options and pathways and possibilities emerge. So that's what it's all about here, trying to look at the intersection climate blockchain, which is really looking at the intersection of regulation and innovation. That's it uh, for me, and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Nick. Um, now I, I'm happy to give the floor to Ryong Backegaard from the EU Innovations uh, Climate Kick. Uh, Climate Kick was um, also somehow the first um, the first partners of, of CLI to um, to to support uh, use cases. Uh, in fact, there were five use cases, and I'm happy um, to give the floor now to Ryong. Um, you have the floor. Thank you, Sven. Um, and thank you, everybody here and also the speakers ahead of me. Sven, I thought that was a really good introduction to blockchain. I feel like I learn something every day. Um, and it's nice to finally be here and see that, that these things are actually coming together. So um, just a bit about Climate Kick. And now if we zoom out a little bit more from the technology to what we're trying to do with blockchain to some of the applications of blockchain, this is where Climate Kick comes in. I myself, uh, I am the portfolio manager, but now also interim director for the decision metrics and finance theme. So I'll explain a little bit about the climate kick and also what we're supporting in the climate ledger initiative. So climate kick started in 2010. Um, we're funded by the EU, but we convene Europe's most influential network uh, of partners that are working towards transformative climate innovation. 
So, like Nick said, you know, Lichtenstein might have been behind the original ideas. We can also like to think of ourselves as a catalyst to support some of these really transformative climate innovations. Um, our vision is to basically enable Europe to lead global transformation, and we actually work with several sectors, public sector, private sector, as well as academic sectors, and try to bring them together to really combine their powers to really come out with some transformative innovations. We have forthright priority themes, and as I mentioned, we're in um, decision metrics and finance, um, and it's here that we work towards uh, exploring and seed funding new innovative uh, metrics or technologies that might actually help unlock finance or unlock uh, decision making to work towards climate action. So a deep dive, I'll give you, and hopefully I'll, I'll, I'm representing all the use cases we're supporting, but um, now we're gonna do deep dive into two of the use cases that we're currently supporting. This one being CleanCoin, which is led by a consortium comprised of South Pole Group, WWF, and CleanTech21. And the basic challenge is this. We, CleanCoin essentially looks at the climate implications of the cryptocurrencies. And if you can see the problem here that the Bitcoin footprint is equal to the carbon footprint of Costa Rica, the Ethereum footprint is equivalent to the carbon footprint of um, Namibia. If you look at the distribution of the carbon footprint, we can see that the majority of the, the Bitcoin is in China, where there's the cheap coal power. Um, Ethereum is a lot smaller, but it's much more heavily in the EU. So we know that the actual servers, the, the technology used behind the blockchain has got this carbon footprint. So what are we actually going to do about it? Here, I'm just going to give you the, the, the images basically to highlight that the CO2 per transaction is quite high relative to, uh, you know, for example, a visa transaction. So some of the solutions that this group is actually looking at is basically, you know, perhaps looking at maybe proof of stake could be much more energy efficient or an alternative to the proof of work, which is a lot about the mining. So proof of stake look, looking at the validation instead. Um, perhaps if we raise awareness about the climate implications of co cryptocurrencies that perhaps users can become aware and want to make changes with that, there could be a potential to make green labels for cryptocurrency miners. Um, that are, so, so cryptocurrency miners that are basically powered by renewables um, could actually have some type of green standard against that. And then also explore options for carbon offsetting for this. Um, so this group has actually today launched the Clean Coins Calculator. So if you click on this link, and I've, unfortunately I can't click on it, but you'll see a current live um, emissions calculator of the Bitcoin and the Ethereum. So the second use case is on Red Chain. Um, and I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with Red, but it's a UNFCCC um, mitigation instrument, which is about avoiding deforestation and therefore avoiding the emissions from forests. So the basic problem is we've got deforestation. If we try and avoid deforestation, we can re avoid the, the release of these. Um, and what the blockchain application here wants to do is to take, to connect this uh, conservation effort to actual finances who actually have the money that want to put money behind the conservation. And this would happen through the blockchain. If you take it step by step, you have this little man who says, we want to protect the forest and receive funding for it. Then you have the companies or the countries or the private sector who say, we want to invest in forest protection measures, but how are we actually going to do that? So let's determine the conditions to make this smart contract. And the smart contract being something that, being this contract that's actually written in code on the blockchain. This would happen to connect, so the, the first step would be connecting the remote sensing and the spatial data carbon accounting, which is on the forest conservation side. Sending that through the blockchain and developing a smart contract, that would be the transaction between the investors and the people who are actually holding the carbon in those forests. So these are two of the five innovation cases that we are supporting currently under the Climate Ledger Initiative. So I thought I'd give you just a taster of the three others, so there's a lot more to come. The first one being the Climate Blockchain Innovation Callout. So this is actually the coordination work to bring the climate and blockchain communities um, together so innovation can actually emerge. 
The third one is on LetChain, which is a software architecture to design efficient and transparent mobility policy solutions and is being tested in Liechtenstein. And the last one being the carbon cockpit, which is led by gold standard um, to make corporate carbon management easier and cheaper and more effective and able to be tracked. So through these five innovation cases, we're really hoping to see some really promising results. And, and obviously, blockchain has got promising potential as well. So really looking forward to seeing what comes out of these two weeks at the COP. Thank you. Thank you, Ryong. I, I know that you have to leave uh, in now. <laughs> so thanks for, for um, jumping in uh, that short note. Um, Sega, if you want, you can take the, the, the seat up there. Um, I now um, have the pleasure to introduce Jörg Füßler. Uh, Jörg is also uh, our one of our core uh, team members um, in the CLI. He is responsible for the research agenda, uh, focusing on the instruments of the Paris Agreement, and he will give us a quick overview about the current status and um, and uh, uh, the direction we want to go with the climate community. Uh, Jörg, you have the floor. Thank you, Sven, and um, thanks for having me here uh, to pre pre present a short overview of the um, Climate Ledger in in Initiative's uh, research ad agenda. So the, the research is an uh, important part, and um, this is financed by the government of Switzerland, and as we just heard, we're also very happy that this is also financed now by Liechtenstein, and we hope to get more partners for, for this over time. So the, the research tries to get a, a comprehensive overview of the different areas that are Im Im important in terms of climate action when it comes to Im implementing the Paris uh, agreement and, and I think it's important also to notion that with the Paris Agreement we are in a different world to to the Kyoto world um, trans transparency and exchange of information is a very key pillar of the Paris ag ag Agreement it has been built completely differently than the Kyoto which was more a top-down um, tar targets and timetable approach par Paris is, is really a, a, about bottom up decentralized um, a, a approaches the the parties the countries have a very strong role in in, in how things are, are done um, measuring accounting tracking reporting on the other hand because it's so decentralized and so heterogeneous have to play a very important role in, in making sure that um, the goals which are very um, ambitious, the overall goal, goals of Paris are actually achieved. There is also a, a, a elaborate process of exchange of information and re review that should help to make sure that the Paris Agreement is met. And uh, if you look at the kind of scale that is necessary in terms of mitigation action and adaptation that is needed for the Paris Agreement, it is obvious that the, pri the private sector has to play a much bigger role. Yet the Paris Agreement, as it is, is more uh, agreement be between co countries, and of, of, of course, and one needs to find ways also how to tie in better the, the private sector. And the main risks at this point in time are probably lacking um, ambition levels and trans uh, transparency. So this is one thing the, the research look at. So what are the needs of the Paris Agreement? What are the needs for imp implementation? On the other hand, we have the whole um, Im Im emerging world of the blockchain technology and with different speech, uh, features such as the decentralized notary. So it's a de decentralized storing of, of data. Um, it can also be used for very small systems. It brings trust to peer-to-peer -peer interactions, trust being a, a, a key um, essential in, in ingredient for the Paris ag ag Agreement. It allows for accessibility and distributed systems, uh, allows for increased trans trans transparency, 
the blockchain mechanism as shown by Sven earlier with that nesting of different blocks um, in a cryptographic way um, leads to a permanent ledger and with, with that to in increased se se data se security. It can also be very efficient with, with smart contracts if you have, for instance, a chip on the hydro power plants turbine which just sends the number of kilowatt hours generated on a daily basis and that then may lead to the direct issuance of credits or the di direct re re release of um, climate finance that can help to make these things very efficient and, and trusted. And um, it's important to, to, to see with uh, Bitcoin or other systems that all, all already ex ex exist. This is a very public uh, system, but there are also per permissioned blockchains where um, the, the access is somehow res res restricted, some, something that may be necessary for doing blockchain in the context of uh, a top-down um, governmental system. Now, there are also quite some risks with blockchains or things we don't know at this point in time. We heard the, the example of the clean toy coin. Um, some of the c current applications of blockchain, they uh, co consume huge um, um, amounts of power, so that's not a s s sustainable way to, 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 to do it. Um, blockchain technology is quite complex. Um, and also, it is generally only at the pilot demonstration stage at, at this point in time, but um, it is ev ev evolving very rapidly. Um, but we also see that it's a kind of a hype at this point in, 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 in time, so one has to be careful not to um, hype it too much, but I'm quite um, confident that this will uh, s still be a topic in, in five years from now. Now, on the research, we try to be really um, comprehensive and look at the different areas of the Paris ag Agreement that where blockchain could play a role. We, we don't know if blockchain can play a role ev everywhere or it's efficient to, to, to use it, but that's the question we, we want to ask. Uh, we look for that at uh, action on the national level for the Paris agreement. This in, involves things like using blockchain for GHG in, in inventories, um, combining in, in inventories which with the nationally de determined contributions by countries, with the tracking of units that may be transferred under um, Article 6 mechanisms. Um, it allows also um, the, the, the registries and tracking for s uh, other markets such as the voluntary market, it may al al allow also to make consistent different systems that will come up um, under art Article 6.2 pro probably and also the Im Im emerging world of the um, I I IKEA COSIA mechanisms from the flight industry that needs somehow to, to be tied in into the Paris ag Agreement f framework if we don't want to have double counting. Also there um, we see a pot potential for this new blockchain te technology. Um, other inst instruments include em emission trading schemes, uh, national clubs, um, carbon taxes and levies, carbon pricing um, on the national level but also for um, companies, corporates, uh, and other things such as feed-in ta tariffs and, and, and so on. And with that, we are getting in also in into the private sector ap ap application. Also, the private sector companies can use blockchains for their own GHG in, in, in inventories, their um, corporate ETSs, footprinting, and also to check if how they are doing with their company tar targets in ESG in general or greening supply chains. Um, another Im Im important part of the Paris Agreement is the climate finance er er area. There are de de developments such as um, results-based finance um, where blockchains can, can be used. 
and um, both for mitigation and a adaptation. And in general, uh, green te te technologies such as re re renewable ed energies can build on blockchains to um, be managed and uh, work better and more if efficiently. Now here um, we picked some of the later de de developments that we all already see um, in the s in that at that intersection between blockchain and climate action and tried to um, put them on the axis. On, on the left hand side you have the, the, the things that are more bottom up, whereas on the right hand side um, the, these are actions that are more top, top down, uh, led by the UNFC or with governmental oversight. Because what, what we know so far is that blockchain came from a bottom up world now and the Paris Agreement and that's these schemes as, as we have them now, they are more top, top, top down and uh, uh, a crucial challenge will be um, how to bring them to, to, together. Um, one key word here is uh, per, per permission blockchain in, in, in instead of public blockchain. So that level of um, bottom up versus uh, top-down um, approach will be important. So we have things like um, blockchain for in, in inventories, NDCs, ITMO tracking, art, art, Article 6 and, and, and so on. There will be a need for some governmental oversight. This will probably be more or less closed systems um, while for measuring, reporting and verification um, these are more bottom-up and um, they are uh, also very um, small and these distributed systems are possible. And you can also use blockchain for the management of project cycles from um, registration to um, validation, verification till uh, issuance of units. So we also see, see there quite a pot pot potential. Another area is the area of finance or crowdfunding for climate where we see quite some ap applications already um, also based on tokenization uh, which if we then go more to the top down area this uh, also plays nicely into the, the results based climate finance or climate finance in general which is one of the aims of the Paris Agreement. Then in the energy sphere, um, you can use blockchains for energy generation, um, managing PV panels, batteries, users, tariffs, and, 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 and so on. Uh, and on a more general level, blockchain can also be used for uh, fi financial in inclusion and access to service because with a blockchain, you can give an identity to people who don't have a bank uh, account, but with, with that they may be ab able to benefit from services such as clean energy or clean water. Then on the more corporate side we have uh, blockchains for tra tracking at attributes con connected to goods, so you can have goods like uh, oil and gas or lemonade or um, CO2 and you can and with the blockchain attach attributes such as su sustainable dev development benefits to, to them and make sure that these uh, values are also uh, monetized through such blo blockchain systems. Um, you can track your uh, B2B B B chains, your su su supply chains, and you can use it in uh, company targets and for carbon pricing. The research usually goes in uh, some steps because we try to bring together the, the climate sphere and the, the blockchain te technologies. So we first look at the, the current and future architecture of these climate action schemes, be it on a national le level, be it in individual um, climate mitigation actions. And we look what what are the schemes, what are the needs, what are the challenges and 
opportunities there. And from that, we go to the blockchain te technologies and look for what are the applications uh, that are possible in cli climate change, what, what is um, av av available now, and also look in into the issues that, that there, there are that may be barriers to using blockchain, barriers to um, re realizing that pot pot potential. And with that, we then bring that together and, and show, uh, show uh, where can blockchain technology del deliver new approaches and so solutions, and how can these different spheres work well together. The research has a, a one strand that is more overview and synthesis to give an a overview on what is happening, and then we, we do some in-depth in research packages that also are um, well uh, linked to individual use cases because it's Im Im important that the, the research is also um, grounded on use cases um, on, the gr on the ground. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg. Thank you. Um, I now have the pleasure to welcome Una Fitzgerald. Um, Una is the Director of Research of the Center for International Governance and Innovation in Canada. And being a lawyer myself, um, this is besides the hashes, one of the other very uh, interesting, well personally I find it interesting, feels how we deal with uh, governance um, and legal aspects of, of running these networks in the, in, in the close future. So uh, Una, you have the floor. Uh, once we have... Uh, uh, it's Um, and there is an upper row afterwards, uh, just to fill in this time gap here, um, where you, of course, all invited. Uh. Is, how do we get the PDF on full screen? Do you know? Start. Okay. <laughs> nope, not, not there yet. Okay, why don't I, I, I start? Um, there's nothing that revolutionary on my slides, so when they do come up, um, we can always catch up with them. So, um, thanks very much for the um, introduction. Uh, the title of my presentation is Climate Change and Blockchain Law and Governance. And I come from a think tank, a nonpartisan think tank based in Canada, Waterloo, Ontario. And um, what we focus on is international law, politics, economics, and governance. Um, in the context of global issues. So we're particularly interested in the interface that was described to you um, in the earlier presentation. So I can, a lot of what I'm gonna say, um, you've heard from different points of view, so I'll, I'll try and keep my, my remarks relatively short on this. Um, Anyway, um, what I'll do is I'll introduce uh, an event we call the Climate Cup, uh, which is this effort to try and bring together policymakers in the climate space and the um, technology um, innovators, and uh, talk a little bit about the structure of the Paris Agreement, just very briefly, um, and then talk about this potential for climate and blockchain to come together, uh, some of the legal, political, and implementation challenges, um, how to use blockchain di and distributed ledger technology to aid transition to um, a green low carbon energy infrastructures. And finally, um, uh, I'll look at uh, green finance and then some conclusions from the Climate Cup. How are you guys doing? <laughs> no such luck. I guess I shouldn't have sent it as a PDF. Okay, so the idea of the Blockchain Climate Cup Roundtable was to um, was to get leading technology innovators and experts in international law and governance working together 
to address global governance challenges. So this is not easy, right? People speak very different languages, and some of you ha likely have been struggling with some of the language today, because, because and you will continue throughout today, because of the differences of the languages that we speak. So what we're trying to do is um, see how using we can use blockchain and distributed ledger technology to codify the Paris Agreement on Climate Change for innovative coordination of complexity. And we're also exploring the potential application of blockchain technology to contribute to climate action, reporting, measurement, and finance. Um, <clears throat> so um, a little bit, we've already heard about the structure of the Paris Agreement. So I'll just run through very briefly. But um, we're talking, for those of you who are more on the technology side, it's an interesting agreement because it's really based on this idea of the nationally determined contributions that each, each state must prepare and maintain and communicate. Um, and then it also talks about voluntary cooperation to um, transferring mitigation outcomes. So this is the idea of one state will help another state to deal with mitigation issues. Um, then it also speaks about mobilizing financial resources to assist developing countries, parties, um, with respect to climate mitigation and adaptation. So um, how do we get that money moving and how can blockchain help there? And then um, in Article 10, it talks about cooperative action on technology development and transfer. So this is a really important element of the Paris Agreement, that we share technologies and offer opportunities to the developing world to perhaps leapfrog on some of these issues um, to make headway with their reporting. Um, Article 12 talks about cooperating in taking measures to enhance climate change through education, public awareness, et cetera. Um, and public access to information. I think blockchain has some potential there given its transparency elements. Article 13 talks about enhanced transparency framework for action and um, building of transparency-related capacity. So how, does, how, does the, uh, how do um, innovators help different countries to address this challenge and, and also help um, civil society with uh, transparency issues? Find, uh, the last two clauses I'll draw attention to are Article 14, which talks about the global stock take, which requires a look and an assessment of collective progress. And then 15 talks about the compliance mechanism, where, in fact, some sort of measurement is really important. So um, what is that potential? Um, Jörg has described a lot of the potential, so I'll just n mention a few things. Um, because the Paris Agreement is so non-prescriptive and so reliant on the contributions of states, it, um, it really does require, it puts a heavy emphasis on reporting and review and peer, peer review by other state parties. And it also facilitates bottom-up um, climate action. So um, what this requires is a lot of data to be collected, and using common but flexible standards for developed and developing countries. Um, what we really need is to develop a reliable global ledger of critical climate data. And um, this could be, I think probably it'll be most interesting if this starts as a bottom-up exercise, because I'm sure it's a little bit threatening to states um, when the technology is still somewhat in development in the development stage. So I think there'll be lots of opportunities to try um, various applications which will help build this eventually into more of a global ledger. So it, w blockchain could be used to track payments for climate mitigation and adaptation projects, track the provenance and value of carbon credits and offsets, increase transparency, trustworthiness of carbon markets, and climate mitigation and adaptation projects, and attract private green finance and green crowdfunding. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a lot of interest in Canada, in Canada because um, we now have subnationals, that is, the province of Quebec and province of Ontario, are sharing, um, uh, they're, they're running a carbon market with California in the United States. And so there's going to be a lot of issues about how do you transfer. Um, credits from one, one system to another. Also, there's carbon tax and carbon credit um, approaches in the two countries. So how we'll, how we'll integrate those will be, I think, aided by using blockchain. And there's interest in pursuing that. Um, helping subnationals track and reduce energy consumption. Uh, this will also be useful. Enabling individuals to track their own carbon footprint. And um, 
uh, tracking critical data, uh, weather events, insurance risks to support the Warsaw mechanism on um, climate loss and damage. At this point, my goodness. Okay, we're now on slide six. So you, we could <laughs> click forward really quickly. You can see the nice pictures of CG. That's in uh, Waterloo. Oops. Okay, why is it not clicking? Can you fix that? Okay. All right. There's the climate cup. <laughs> this is the uh, the structure of the Paris Agreement. And we're just talking about this. And now we're talking about the um, Climate Cup event. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to that now. So um, I'm just, I've put a lot of names on that just to indicate to you that there's a lot going on in this space. So when we had the Climate Cup in Toronto in June, of, uh, June 24th this year, it was wonderful. We had, um, we had folks both in person and virtually connecting to show their examples of projects that, um, that they're working on in the blockchain climate space. You're going to hear more from um, Anton and his colleague Sergey uh, in a couple of minutes, so I won't d go into any detail. But this is just to show you some of them. Um, Michael Casey, he presented from uh, MIT Digital Currencies Initiative. It's this idea of a way to fund um, the development of, of grids in, in circumstances where communities are not able to get financing. And that, I can tell you that that created a lot of interest in Ontario for helping with um, doing electricity um, um, and uh, new solar pro projects and wind projects on, um, on uh, indigenous uh, territory. So um, there's lots of interesting applications. So we looked at how uh, blockchain could be used for green finance. Oops, sorry. We also looked, now I'm really getting confused. We also looked at the legal, political, and implementation challenges that remain. So this is still a space where there's technologists, innovators, and there's also the policy people trying to put together the rule book for the Paris, uh, for the Paris Agreement, and each state is working out how it's going to fully implement its NDCs. So there's still a lot of work to do in this space. It's true that blockchain throws up many challenges because it's very decentralized. It's, it's um, in a sense, almost anarchic, uh, not really n focused on sovereign states. So there will be challenges to address. But I think there's opportunities, as, as um, you'll probably hear from Alexandra, about, um, in, in using this technology to make advances, do useful use cases and test cases. And from there, we'll see um, whether governments will take it up. Um, the, uh, in the discussion, there was also a uh, consideration of how blockchain and distributed ledger technology could be used to aid the transition to a green, low-carbon energy infrastructure. And there were some amazing um, examples given there um, of, of different approaches that are being taken. And you can see from the names of some of the participants that there were some of the leading lights in this area. So it's clearly a space where there is um, already a lot of uh, a lot of activity and lots of interesting use cases being developed. The question is, how do we scale those up and, um, and demonstrate uh, success? So in the, um, in the Climate Cup, we also did a breakout session to dig deep into some of the challenges fo fa facing uh, the um, introduction of blockchain in the area of climate finance, environmental data and transparency, and distributed energy production. I won't go into details on that, but you can read the report. It's online today. Um, and you can see the sorts of challenges that we've identified and some of the steps that will be um, looked into to address those challenges going forward. So as you can see, there's lots of work to do in this space to, to bring together technologists and the policy people who attend um, climate meetings like this to try and find where there can be some, some common ground. Thank you very much. Thank you, Una, and um, thanks for this, this interesting <laughs> summary. And uh, that gives me now um, the pleasure to, to introduce um, Sergey, who just fixed the, the screen because he's the, the, our IT guy here on the, on the board, and he's a, a blockchain developer. And um, we might need you again to, um, <laughs> to put on your presentation. Sergey is here together with Anton Galinovich. Um, they are both involved in, in 
to my knowledge, one of the first uh, complete uh, projects um, on in, in the carbon markets sphere that run on the blockchain. Um, the project has the title DAO IPCI. DAO is for Decentralized Autom Autonomous Organization. Organization. Uh, we will learn a bit uh, in, a, in a second. Um, and... Um, We have a. Okay. Thank you very much, Sven. Uh, and in fact, we just came from a, a big conference uh, in Cancun, uh, where we presented uh, our uh, our solution to the blockchain community, uh, to the uh, you know public and programmable blockchain. And it is, a, you know, a, a very interesting and important task to present to uh, the solution to both uh, important communities, to the climate community and to the blockchain community, and they are very much different. So uh, this is um, this is our really uh, a practical solution and what we're going to talk about is really not the concepts or plans or you know ideas but what's really working right now so this is a, 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 a an integral platform for climate initiatives that is already working and I could probably skip the slides uh, that describe the threats of uh, climate uh, change and damages and uh, it's important to describe those for a blockchain community who might not understand it fully but not in, but not here uh, the thing is that our approach is based on the uh, concept that the uh, those environmental damages uh, those climate change damages are caused by human activity and even more specifically by uh, a specific activity like deals and contracts that uh, people uh, you know make between them like buyer and seller if you buy an air uh, an air traveling ticket that's the real cause of the uh, of the emissions uh, and so on and uh, you know it's became now already a business custom to trace those things it was you know really interesting a few years ago uh, there was a mm, a study by Berkeley uh, lab uh, the uh, you know a, f a, a carbon footprint of an indoor cannabis production and it came up with a pretty tremendous figures like you know uh, like one kilogram of uh, production of indoor cannabis equals to uh, 4.6 tons of CO2 and you know the final recommendation was to legalize marijuana because you know because that would eliminate the demand for indoor uh, production and thus the reduction of carbon emissions would be great. That, that's, uh, I mean, everything is uh, uh, is traceable and uh, accountable in terms of CO2, and it's very convenient, and it is a really convenient uh, meter or index because it it doesn't only measures the CO2 emissions, it measures uh, energy efficiency, it measures really the combustion of fossil fuels, uh, and so on and so on. It's, 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 a very com it's very convenient and it's become, you know, customary for, uh, for business to, to, uh, to evaluate these things. And our basic concept is that, you know, uh, that there are uh, three parties involved, a buyer, a seller of the goods and uh, services, and there is a collateral damage that might be ev evaluated in terms of CO2. And then you have to, to mitigate, uh, to, to reimburse the damage, or somehow to mitigate the damage uh, in, uh, you know, equal or more uh, uh, so you have you gotta have a you know a, 
a provider of these mitigation outcomes. And in the ideal world, those are the three participants. Once they agree, the, it's settled. That's it. You, you, you offset or mitigate the damage that is produced by your deal or contract. But in the real world, you always have to, you know, you have, you have to have an entity that would assess, evaluate what is the damage, are those mitigation outcomes real, and you always have a, pers a person or entity that would want to be in charge and tell you that, you, that, that uh, this transaction should be settled, this is not to be settled, those are the entities that could evaluate this thing, and so on and so on. And, and in, a new, in a real world, it's highly regulated, and there is always someone that wants to be in charge uh, and is in charge. Uh, and, and we know that, you know, that, of course, you all probably seen this picture, that the carbon market is uh, broken in many, many, many pieces and uh, fragmented in pieces. And uh, although they all deal with the same one ton of CO2 equivalent, uh, they are broken by barriers by many, uh, into many pieces. So what we've tried to do is to, uh, to create an environmental or digital uh, space where technically they all can, uh, can operate together. I mean, they can be fully independent or, may, or they may uh, cooperate to the extent they wish to but in the same digital space using the same uh, smart contracts. And uh, uh, because, you know, in the real carbon markets, the regulators only admit specific stakeholders to participate it. They allocate, well, frankly speaking, almost arbitrarily the quotas or allocations to, uh, to the stakeholders they want. And, uh, but in real life, the, the damage that is caused by climate change is, is uh, everyone is affected by this, but not everyone is, is admitted to participate in the market. And what blockchain does is, uh, you know, provides technical and you know, an economical opportunity for a direct peer-to-peer peer, peer -peer participation of anyone who is interested uh, in it. Um, so that's what uh, our uh, solution provides for, for, for any, uh, so to say, climate environmental mitigation program to exist, to launch its, so to say, sovereign representation in blockchain and, and work there. Uh, <coughs> uh, so it really works right, right now. You can, you know, launch your own program and go and uh, offset your carbon footprint and uh, or uh, trade the units. Uh, but um, the the and of course, you know. The, the carbon footprint of cryptocurrency has been already mentioned here. Yes, um, it also may be offset as a part of, uh, of, of, the, of the efforts. And, uh, you know, the, the plans for development are really uh, extensive. And the, uh, the main direction here is, I think, is to try to substitute those uh, physical uh, verifiers or operators, maybe in the ideal world, or maybe it might, it might sound utopic, but in some in some future, by a by smart contracts. And here I would want uh, to ask Sergey to take uh, the stand and describe how it might look in uh, from a technology point of view. Yeah. Thank you, Anton. Good day, everyone. My name is Sergei Vanshakov. I try to speak hurry. Um, my part of presentation will be uh, from viewpoint of developers uh, who are working now with blockchain technology. Because um, I think it's important for you to know what is exactly think about Paris Agreement we 
who is developed blockchain technology. So my presentation, how we can prepare Mars for DevCon, it's the biggest conference from Ethereum blockchain platform. And um, you know, Mars today is not a comfortable for humans. It's a very cold place and atmosphere is not uh, friendly for our breath. And if we uh, resolve issue with logistics, with SpaceX or s other space program, next question will be, can we make uh, Mars a little bit comfortable for uh, blockchain developers conference? And it's maybe we'll be surprised, but Paris Climate Agreement can help us because if you find abstract or executive summary about Paris Climate Agreement, you f find main task of Paris Climate Agreement. And for me, main task of Paris uh, Agreement is the first planetary terraforming experiment based on economical game. So with this vision, I try now work with uh, Anton and IPCI project because my main work is the human to machine systems. I working on this uh, research work last three years. We try to build uh, supply chain, planetary supply chain with direct economical communication between human and machines. But today Paris Agreement is a human to human system with a strong reputation requirements. And for me, it's a strange because Paris Agreement, it's experiment, planetary experiment, but strong, strong reputation requirement creates some like a private club for small piece of humans who work on small piece of planet. Or it. So I think if we shift Paris Climate Agreement to Ethereum network, only to public Ethereum network, Paris Agreement can be human to machine system. And I can show how exactly it can work after. We have a manufacturer who want to be involved in Paris Agreement. And at the same time, we build smart cities around the world. These smart cities have a many type of different sensors who can collect data about carbon footprint. These smart cities can send annual reports to Ethereum network. We can install additional packages to Ethereum network validators with carbon credit emission algorithm. And after that, Ethereum network can issue new carbon credits. Green humans can buy these carbon credits and our collected funds can be spread between manufacturers who choose a green economy way, smart cities who help them, and Ethereum network validators who are involved in this process. And if we do it, we can just change terraforming task from Paris Climate Agreement to prepare Mars for blockchain conference in the uh, next 50 years. And um, now we have a ready-to-work package of smart contracts for credit car uh, carbon credit market. We built first the sterilized application for human-to-human -human communications. And my team, my research team in AeroLab are now working on build uh, first uh, carbon footprint sensors network with Ethereum network validators based on uh, human to machine concepts. In the next year, we will show first algorithm to issue carbon credits based on Ethereum network. And we want to launch first service for reducing your carbon fruit with only carbon credits based on Ethereum network. Here is our contacts and uh, here that's all what I want to say you today. Thank you. I'm sorry, I just wanted to, to add a, a bit. Uh, you know, uh, the you know to, to, to my mind it's very important to point out that there are no no really uh, a big technological uh, barriers to implementing blockchain technology for climate action the barriers lie mainly in the p political uh, sphere whether the the operators the regulators would want to be deprived of part of their authorities to and to operate on blockchain. 
On the other, and on the other hand, it's not just a new technology introduction. It's the introduction of a new economic paradigm of interact decentralized interaction between economic agents. And uh, we've, uh, uh, we thank you very much, and Alastair Mark, who, who you know, organized a book, uh, publishing a book describing this, uh, uh, these things, and it, it will be presented here at COP23. But it's not really only about technology. Th this is a new paradigm of economical interaction. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. So last but not least, uh, and thanks for, for waiting that long, um, Alex Gallard um, Paris from the Secretariat, actually from the office of, of the, the Executive Secretariat, um, is now giving um, a little bit of, not the Secretariat perspectives, but uh, also about the potential of, of blockchain and climate action. And um, Alex, you have the floor. So first of all, good night, everyone, and welcome to Bonn. Welcome to COP23. Uh, I want to thank you very much, the organizers of this event, uh, the government of Liechtenstein, the government of Switzerland, INFRA, and all of the panelists. Um, I will keep my presentation very brief, because basically I am between uh, uh, basically, uh, it is the last thing between now and your reception, welcome reception. Uh, so, I, f I think, uh, you know, so I think uh, everyone might be a bit tired. These are new concepts. Some of the things that I, uh, was also new for me today that I heard from this panel. Um, my first remark comes from uh, uh, a speech gave by um, Christine Lagarde. And my, my colleagues have described, and I think it was a perfect description of this speech, as one of the most seminal and maybe underrated speech of this year. And when she said, it may not be wise to dismiss virtual currencies. And when she's referring to virtual currencies, she's not referring to PayPal, or kind of e-payment. She's basically describing, and, and she details, cryptocurrency and blockchain-based peer-to-peer um, money. And this is quite remarkable, and maybe a, a turning point, because I have next to, to her uh, quote, the paper in 2008 that for the first time described blockchain technology. The play paper is called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, electronic cash system. And in the first line of the abstract, it says a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash that would allow for online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institutions. And think about, she was speaking to head of central banks and saying, you have to watch this technology. So the first application of blockchain technology is in the realm of currency. Uh, however, with the evolution, industry has seen that the applications of blockchain goes, goes way beyond uh, currency. So I have this report from Moody's, one of the most important uh, rating agencies, that have I identified only uh, among those, um, and among their clients, 120 ongoing blockchain projects in so many different areas, such as uh, media and entertainment, um, ID, uh, cybersecurity, many different areas. So industry is, is looking into this technology to be applied to um, several different areas. And within the UN system, that's not different. There are 16 different uh, UN entities uh, with uh, pr projects or initiatives related to blockchain. Here is the full list. Um, just want to highlight two of them very quickly. Uh, one which is the most advanced one is the, the World Food Program. Uh, I spoke to them recently. They, uh, they are doing a, a project that's basically uh, humanitarian, direct 
cash transfers from the World Food Program to people in need uh, in, in regions of, of uh, Africa and Middle East. And what they explained to me was that because they used blockchain technology, the two key advantage was they, they managed to bypass uh, local intermediaries, such as a bank. So it's direct money transferred for, for the beneficiaries. And the, the, the speed that they were, were able to, uh, to scale up the process was also, uh, would not have been, been possible uh, without this technology. So they started with 100, 1,000. Now they have already 100,000 beneficiaries with this project. Uh, the other one that I think is worthwhile mention is in the ITU. So ITU is the um, International Telecommunications Union, and they are working on on discussing uh, a standardized way to use blockchain, which is very important because currently we have different protocols. So with an international body, if you uh, um, aims for international project, standardization is an important area of work. Now going to the climate, why we are discussing this here. Article 10 of the Paris Agreement highlights that accelerating and encouraging and enabling innovation, that's the key word, is critical for an effective long-term global response to climate change and promoting sustainable development. Um, so blockchain technology, you heard a lot from, from several speakers today, uh, can uh, provide high levels of trust among all the nodes, all the users of, of this network, and uh, can also have benefits in, in terms of monitoring. Uh, some of the foreseeable applications of blockchain technology uh, related to climate action are listed here. For example, improved carbon uh, emission trading is a, a potential use, peer-to-peer uh, -peer renewable energy trading, uh, there's a, a pilot project very interesting in, uh, in New York called the Brooklyn Microgrid. Uh, it was also highlighted uh, during um, the workshop in Toronto. I think it's, it's a pioneer project. Now they're expanding to other countries. It's basically microgrids that you can trade your excess energy with your neighbor peer to peer using the blockchain. Um, enhanced climate violence flows could be another interesting application better tracking and reporting, supply chain management, land titling, and the list goes on. Uh, so the, UN the UNFCCC Secretariat recognizes that there is a potential in the blockchain technology, especially regarding these key aspects of improving transparency, cost effectiveness, efficiency, stakeholder integration, and enhancing uh, the creation of global public goods. So the Secretariat will support initiatives that are in this um, intersection of blockchain and climate change. So as I promised, my presentation was short. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for that uh, quick summary. Um, we have some time left now for some questions. I'm sure uh, actually there should not be any questions left. Everything is said. But nevertheless, I give, uh, we, we, we take the opportunity, um, if there are questions from the audience to our, our guests here, um, please, uh, audience, you have the floor. Yes, um, we have uh, microphones here on the, on the right. Um, wait, maybe I'm... Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you actually for, for the presentation. My name is Alberto from Perspectives. I wanted to ask you, now that uh, it's clear that this is a decentralized technology, and I was wondering um, whether the technology needs to be available in both sides. I'm thinking about uh, transactions between developing and developed countries. Does the technology need to be also available in the developing country? Um, or is it enough if only one of the parties has access to this technology uh, for for the blockchain to be really useful? So how realistic is it is that it can be used both in developing and developed countries in the short term? That's my question. Um, I 
I propose we collect some questions first and then, yeah. Um, anyone? Please. My question is for the young programmer that is using Ethereum platform to generate carbon credits. Um, will you do an initial coin offering or is it gonna be issued by the sensors? How are you planning to to actually develop the platform for DEF CON 50 or how you want to call it? Um, ah, yeah, it's now we collect questions uh, after yeah, I can yeah. answer. I also, also okay, if you, if you want to directly uh, give the answer and then we come back to to the, the question from the gentleman here in the middle. Um, Sergey? If 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 be short, uh, now we have some funds to do that. Uh, next, it's our passion. It's uh, second reason we we doing it. And uh, after we find some good economical model, and we s uh, after we see uh, we need some uh, token inside because today tokens it's two types. It's utility tokens for infrastructure as a service, and second, it's assets. So uh, now we need some time to uh, understand what type of tokens do they need to do in carbon credit markets. We need doing utility token for building infrastructure and it will be some like commission to using centralized system in b other, uh, both sides of developing co countries and uh, Europe and other. And second, il or it will be some like derivatives from markets of many types of small tokens by, uh, with carbon, carbon credits ideas. So that's it. Ayuk? Uh, yeah, maybe quickly um, an answer on the question of Al Alberto. Thanks a, a, a lot. Um, I think the concept of developing countries versus de developed countries um, doesn't make a lot of sense in the blockchain fi field. Uh, you may know that um, most of, for instance, the, the Bitcoin farms that I know of uh, in, in, in China, are in, in China, actually a lot of uh, know-how is, is, is there, lots of papers. I, th I think Nick once mentioned that there are now more paper in Chinese published than in other lang languages on, on blockchain. So. I and also there is, for instance, an initiative in uh, Cost, Costa Rica. They are uh, very strong in that te te technology. They want to use that blockchain for their own nation national registry. So I think these boundaries are really blurring. Of course, a uh, uh, challenge is to bring blockchain also to very poor countries, but we think um, given the decentralized nature and the, the, the possibility to pro provide access to individuals that don't, bank, don't, don't have bank accounts and, and so on, uh, I think are good uh, factors to make that happen. Yeah, I'd like to add to that quickly. I mean, when you think about uh, distributed ledger technologies in general, the blockchain in particular, the current applications, uh, of course, um, this is now very much sort of technology focused. We're speaking about hash functions, you know, here at, at the climate conferences. In the future, this is not going to be the case. Blockchain and other distributed ledger technologies are going to be underlying to what we do on top of them. Very similar today, most people will not know exactly how HTTP protocols work. Still, they can perfectly well use the internet. I agree with everything what Jörg says. This on the, the difference developed developing countries that is not relevant here. It is actually a technology that is out in the open with data in the network distributed all across, and there is no difference between developed and developing countries. So, if there is um, no question, yes, the gentleman here in the front. Got here a little late, so I'm not sure if maybe you already covered this part. But the value of this market for blockchain and climate finance, what do you see it in the next sort of five years compared to right now? Jörg, please. 
I mean, the value in achieving the Paris Agreement is probably more in something like gigatons of CO2 than in US dollars. So I see the, the main value there. And um, I think there is really a lot of opportunities in very different er er areas for that te te technology. But at this point in time, I think the blockchain te te technology is, is quite early days, but um, it's very rapidly ev ev evolving. There is a huge potential. I think we should be clear also that it's not the silver bullet for solving all the issues we have with um, implementing Paris, but um, I see it as pro providing really a good mo momentum in many er areas of the Paris Agreement implementation. If I could just add a comment on that. I think it's a good question because um, we're, we're still talking here about trying to encourage this intersection between uh, you know, ideas about how blockchain could apply to addressing climate action. But to the extent that uh, people can really find a way to make money doing this, obviously that will, will um, speed up the uh, the adoption of the technology. So I, it's good to be looking at it from that point of view as well, even though from I think all the people at this table, the end game is to actually use it to reduce GHGs, but hopefully money can be made in the process. <laughs> okay, then I take this, uh, this moment of silence to, uh, to close that side event. It was a pleasure uh, to have uh, my speakers here with me and to have you in the room. Um, I just want to issue a quick thank you to the Liechtenstein government, the government of Switzerland, as well as Intras co-hosting the side event, as well as to Alex, to Sergei, to Una, Nick, and Jörg, and Anton. Um, it was great, and to me as well, thank you. Um, I hope uh, catering worked, so there should be some drinks outside, and um, yeah, I hope to see you outside and uh, to continue the discussion further. Thank you very much.